Welcome to Intersections, where inner mastery meets outer impact. Our goal in this podcast is to dissolve the boundaries that may otherwise limit and confine us, because in doing so, we create the conditions for achieving and discovering our highest potential for humanity, for the universe, for our own selves, and for our communities. At Intersections today, I have someone who is, in so many ways, a tremendous role model for me, Melissa Bernstein. She is a successful entrepreneur, creator, and author, having spent the last 30 years helping children discover themselves, their passions, and their purpose through open-ended play. Having founded, with her husband, Doug, one of the most successful toy companies in the United States with over a billion dollars in annual revenue. And yet, behind the scenes, even with her continued success and in living the American dream, she has faced mental health challenges for a large part of her life. After making her journey in self-discovery and acceptance, Melissa has collaborated again with her husband to start a new organization, Lifelines, with a mission of developing a whole series of well-being products and experiences to help adults strengthen their resilience, stay grounded, and unlock their full potential. She's also published a memoir called Lifelines, in which, in addition to beautiful photographs, that includes some really wonderful poetry that she herself has written. So it is my joy and privilege to welcome into our midst today, Melissa. Melissa, a warm welcome. Thank you for joining us. I am so honored to be here. I'm honored as well. I'm actually in almost a state of awe because uh, when I look at the arc of your life, so much of the human quest and the human condition has been playing out in it. And you've been kind enough to actually share, uh, you know, so much of that, you know, in the public arena with some of your more recent work, uh, which we will come to in a short while. Uh, for now, I just want to start by celebrating the incredible amount of just things that you've accomplished in, in yet a very fertile and evolving life with, um, you know, a beautiful family. You've raised six children and um, an entrepreneurial quest that you've gone on with your husband, which has not just been financially very successful, but has also brought a certain innovation, a certain beauty, a certain sweetness to the lives of children that at times, you know, the commercial world doesn't necessarily pay a lot of attention to. So thank you for all you've done. Oh, that is so poetic. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think like one question for any of us who watched my intro and discovered and learned, you know, so many facets to your luminous diamond, right? Uh, I think I think uh, one natural question for people would be like, how how have you managed to accomplish all this in the confines of the same 24 hours that myself and everyone here who's listening and all of us, you know, face? What's the secret to your productivity? That's a great question. I would say the continual, incessant, rabid search for meaning. You know, I have been in an existential meaning crisis my entire life and trying to find that way that I can leave the world a little bit better than when I entered it. And for me, that salvation came in turning the internal chaos into tangible form through creating things. And the more chaos I feel, the more I need to channel it from my head, through my heart, through my fingers into products. And that's why I've created, you know, 10,000 products in, in the toy world. And it's still not even enough because that unfortunately, <laughs> that feudal race, that search uh, continues on in my life. Wow. Yeah. Thank you for sharing the, uh, the continued open-ended sort of nature of that quest. Um, it's, it's such a beautiful search to go on, you know, uh, the search for meaning uh, and understanding yet one that can be tortured in its own way when the answers aren't coming at the pace one wants to. Uh, so uh, we want to, we want to unpack that a little bit. We want to talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, thousands of toys. Uh, I'd like to flash a few images on the screen for uh, our, our friends so that if you're watching this more than just listening to it, you can see examples of these beautiful creations uh, from you, Melissa, uh, and Doug, you know, your husband as well. The ask I have of you is that um, when we face that kind of inner turmoil, some of us get consumed by it. 
some of us, it sort of makes us go on a downward spiral. We get paralyzed almost. And then one pathway out of it that I've seen since I've um, you know, had the privilege of working with some of the preeminent psychotherapists in, uh, for example, cognitive behavior therapy, you know, Dr. David Burns from Stanford, he's been a regular guest on this podcast as well. He's a, a very dear mentor and friend for the last about 15 years now for me. You know, one pathway out of it is to find a way to reason yourself out of it, to identify, you know, thoughts and you know, beliefs that it might be limiting you or, you know, et cetera, and find distortions in those thoughts and then work on them, you know, all of that, right? And ultimately what you get to do is, I like to call it like ironing out the wrinkles in your thought. Uh, David Burns calls them like untwisting your thoughts. But I'm also hearing from you almost a different pathway, you know, and that pathway is to take that swirl and that turmoil and that energy that gets created within and use it for a positive purpose to do something that perhaps... An ordinary model who's not facing, you know, those life crisis moments may not have that gift, you know, of that focus, that energy, that angst, that, you know, all of that, right? Is, is, is that right? I mean, that's how I'm reading your story. It is exactly that. You know, I view my existential angst, that, that meaning crisis, the despair that in the end, it may not mean anything. And instead of becoming submerged in it, in my head, I've realized that I can actually tangibly mold it into a ball of energy and I can channel it through my body, out my hands into creative expression. And when I do that, so for the first 20 years of my life, I didn't do that. I, right. I, became, I became submerged by it and, and I did create, but I created dark things that couldn't touch other people. Mm -hmm. And the connection for me came because our only meaning comes through, in my opinion, serving others, right? And using something in us to better the lives of others. So it's only when I channeled it into mm -hmm. positivity yeah. that could impact others that it began to uh, become real meaning for me. You know, it's uh, reminding me of a practice that um, I found very valuable to um, introduce into my class in personal leadership and success at Columbia and the MBA program. And uh, and that's a, a practice of personal journey storytelling. And, you know, I invite every student in the class to share a personal journey, three to four minutes. It's a blank canvas. You can share anything, you know, that you are personally stirred by. And people talk about in really powerful, you know, transformational experiences they've gone through. They talk about a grandmother who was a Holocaust survivor or, you know, just a personal passion they have of some kind or, you know, et cetera. And what I noticed at some point is I had to give them a little bit of guidance, you know, to get the story right, ultimately, for this class, for the intentions it had. And that guidance was to always make the story have a certain redemptive quality to it. Mm -hmm. Always make it something that is ultimately about a hero's journey, not about being beaten up by life, not about like getting to some kind of just like struggle, dead end, disappointment, pain, just because you have the opportunity in this class to open up and share and you know, express vulnerability and know that you're going to have very empathetic shoulders to cry on, which is what the class, you know, can do for you. But to take it, you know, take it one, you know, one notch higher. And once I've done that, the, you know, quality of storytelling has just gone up so much. Um, and, um, you know, I, I noticed that like, that's kind of what you're, you know, this is not a story. This is an actual experience in life that you've gone through. But that's kind of the breakthrough you achieved, I guess, 20 years into, into this journey. Yeah, my life mantra has become, and this is the act of living for me, step on out of the head and move into the heart, free to channel all dread into jubilant art. Ah, look at that. Is that one of your um, own composed poems? Yes, one of, one of my many, but, but most of them are literally part of my practice. They're my lifelines and the reason I'm here. And that one became my mantra. If I wasn't going to become submerged by my head and go down, the ship was going down. If I became stuck in that, that despair, I had to actively channel it into positivity. And that has oh. become the message of my life. That is so beautiful. That is so beautiful. And I want to come back and talk a little bit about your uh, craft or poetry in a few minutes, but let's just stay with this um, piece a little bit around your search for meaning, right? And you, you mentioned this as an open quest. So would you say that continues to therefore be like a key motivator for you, a key force for you? It's still something that you're working on? It's everything. So I 
basically made the journey from existential nihilism, which is a sense that there is no meaning to life and we as individuals have no ability to make meaning in a meaningless existence, to becoming very much an existentialist, which is belief that we as humans actually do have control and the power to transform our lives through engaged, committed action. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. How beautiful. How wonderful. You know, you remind me of a moment um, uh, when I was in school and it was a happy day from the outside. A lot of good things were happening. My friends and I were going to, you know, walk out of campus and engage in a little bit of fun and social life and probably eat something, you know, really, you know, kind of yummy. And instead, I just sat down on the pavement and I had a little bit of like a depressed look on my face. And my, my friends are coming to me worrisomely and you know, Hitendra, what, like, what's, what's wrong with you? Come on, man, like, get out, let, let's go, you know. And I'm like, what's the point? I'm like, what's the point? Because like this day is going to finish, right? Just like yesterday. And then the next day is going to finish. And before you know it, we graduate. And after that, you know, we live out our adult life. And all these dreams that we have, we'll live all of them out if we ever, even ever get to them. And then we'll die. And it'll all be over anyway. So like, what's the point, you know? Yeah. So I went through that moment. I, I can connect a little bit, I guess, to, you know, the angst that you, you spoke about. But I also want to observe the following, um, Melissa, um, which is, um, in some ways, this is a really interesting confluence that is happening here between you and me in our conversation, because I tell you, um, I, I did find some breakthroughs for me, you know, in that quest for meaning, uh, in studying the scriptures, for example, in India. And um, sometime back, after having lived in the United States for over 25 years, I asked myself, um, what is my relationship with India? What is my relationship with America? I haven't chosen to live there. You know, I gave up that passport to get the American passport, be a full-fledged citizen here. And I realized that, you know, the greatest gift India gave me was answers to some of those most fundamental questions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's the most important thing to me. You can strip out all of the other stuff that I've achieved over life or not, you know, or quested for. But that like clarity about those answers was like the greatest gift that India gave me. You know, what happens to um, my consciousness, you know, after I die? Did it exist before I was born? Do I have some relationship with the rest of the universe? Is my family just meant to be my blood family or also, mm -hmm. you know, others, you know, who are not just of the human ilk, but perhaps other forms of life as well? What's my, intuitively, I feel some connection, but what is the connection? Any or all of that? Now, of course, you know, it's a lifelong quest, but there was some basic answers on karma and reincarnation and the soul and the creative spirit and all of that, which kind of like settled me down a little bit, you know. And yes. um, uh, so that's one part. But on the other hand, I had this hunger for outer achievement. And that drew me to America as the uh, exemplar of how to master the outer forces of nature, you know, and, and engage with them through a more higher Western, modern, civilizational kind of, you know, kind yeah. of way. Right. And here you are, you know, you have achieved so much on that outer plane uh, and and you're, you know, questing even more on the on the on the inner side. Right. Like, so it's funny how life deals these cards to us. Yeah, I think, you know, I think the Western world, the Western culture does us such a disservice. Right. It tells us that we can pursue happiness on the outside and we will achieve it and we will achieve that elusive dream of the white picket fence and the butterflies and the rainbows and the meadows. And it's a lie. I mean, you cannot achieve inner satisfaction, inner peace through external material achievements. And I believed in the dream and I achieved it. I mean, I achieved everything and more that I could ever dream of, including like an incredible husband and Doug for, you know, I've known him for, for decades, you know, every, every material thing that I could have ever wanted. But the truth was I was empty inside. I had never accepted myself as who I was. And because of that, I would never achieve any form of solace or fulfillment or bounty. Wow. Wow. You know, it's such an important message for our, you know, generation today to hear. Uh, it's such an important message, Melissa. I want to read an excerpt from your book, uh, Lifelines, uh, which is where you're, you know, offering even more service to the world, right? Beyond this beautiful toy business that you've created to help um, express some of these deeper, you know, truths that you have, you know, explored over the, you know, the course of uh, life, right? Um, and so uh, this is a, this is a, 
a poem that you've written. I mean, there's just so many you know, gems here in this book, but this is a piece that you've written that uh, really, really spoke to me uh, about that sort of deeper, you know, quest for meaning. And, you know, you say, in death, do we return to floating gently in the womb or does darkness overwhelm and leave us rotting in a tomb? Or do angels lead the way into a luminescent light? I'll be searching for that answer till I say my last good night. How beautiful. Okay. Isn't that the the ultimate question, right? What happens to us in that next phase? Mm, so beautiful. When did you realize that you had a, you know, both, I guess, like a hunger, but also a gift of penmanship in, in, in writing out your thoughts and feelings into these uh, very beautiful, accessible, very accessible, stirring, you know, pithy poems? You know, I saw them in my head from age two. Wow. And I see them entirely finished. And it's it's basically, I think, all the questions that no one could answer and the questions that are beyond sort of my own comprehension, kind of the answers um, came to me in these verses. And, uh, you know, I, I started to pen them when I was about three and never showed them to anyone because they were so dark. So many of them were really pondering, like even at that young age, kind of the meaning of life. And I think when I was five, you know, I wrote the verse, the burden of myself is almost more than I can bear. Yet rather than slip further down this mountain of despair, I will simply cry for help and hope an angel hears my plea, or I'll not survive much longer and succumb to misery. Uh -huh. And like, I, I wrote these as my my pleas, but I knew no one would really uh, accept me in that darkness. So I just hid them away. And they were really, to be honest, they were such a nuisance. And it was like a ticker tape continually running across my brain. And I would be like, get out of there. I don't want to see you today. But I, I couldn't really stop it. I tried. Um, and even when I would scribe it, like another one would appear. Uh, so it was, it was, I realized it was my own way of trying to make sense of what to me was senseless, right? The, the question of existence and like, why are we doing this silly inane game if we're all just going to expire? Yeah, yeah. So let me unpack that for a minute because that was quite um, mind-boggling for someone who's not, you know, at all natural in, in, in poetry writing. But did you just imply in what you said that um, you didn't have to, you know, in a very effortful way, take a thought and idea, start to, you know, kind of pen it down, then refine it, then think about how to rhyme it, then think about the number of syllables and make sure that it had the right kind of fit, you know, I mean, like, it kind of like pretty much in a well formed way, you know, the verse would just like show up. Yeah, I mean, there's there's kind of, I, I experienced the full gamut. So sometimes it's literally 24 lines, that many completely like come out and they're, I don't have to change a thing. Other times it's like a, huh, isn't that interesting the way people say one thing and do another? And I just ponder. So my brain is like the biggest kitchen in the world. And there are a whole bunch of pots simmering on the stove. Some of them are boiling over and they're the ones closest to me. And some are on the back burner and they're just simmering. So sometimes I get a, a thought like, huh, you know, people are so odd the way they they act and do and say different things. And I'll put it in there and it's on the back burner. And then the next day, yeah. the verse will, will come to oh, mind. Wow. Yeah. And sometimes that verse might not be like perfect. So for me, that becomes one of my favorite processes, which is like the honing process. And it's like a rock, a river rock, that a river stone that keeps getting, um, the water keeps flowing over it and honing it until it's perfectly formed. So sometimes they're they're perfect as is. Um, and to, to me, they have to flow like a song because I write music yeah. too. They yeah. have to have a rhythm and a beat and effortlessly flow. If yeah. they don't, I'm like tortured and I cannot sleep or eat or do anything. If I have a verse, that came out and it's like missing something. I'm like, uh, I, it's like a splinter in my foot. I, I can't, I can't rest until it's removed. Oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. You know, the way you've described your brain, it seems like an advanced supercomputer that has this, uh, you know, hard drive in which you're keeping on packing like more and more and more. And then there's a, 
you know, CPU that sort of processes all of that and comes out through its algorithms into these be- beautiful, beautiful, very rhythmic and rhyming, you know, gems for us. But, yeah. but the story of my life was that simplicity, those simple, you could thank you for calling them gems. I call them like dark pieces of, you know, stone that, that weren't polished. Um, they were rejected by, you know, mainstream society. And I think one of the, the you, you might say my brain is like that, but the, but the fascinating thing is that I'm so simple. And like, for me, those big abstruse ideas that I could never understand have to be distilled into something so simple and clear and concrete that a child can understand them. And I think That was this weird dichotomy, right? Because I was thinking things that were impossible to even verbalize, yet trying to distill them into verses so simple that they didn't require any deciphering. And mainstream society that says that things have to be complex and we need to decipher them really, you know, rejected my my verses completely. And when they rejected my verses, like I felt truly rejected as a person in my essence. So I think creating toys, ironically, because I stopped writing verses for three decades after they were rejected by a a, a noted authority. Uh, Toys became another method of channeling sort of that, that, that complexity of thought into very simple designs that a child could easily understand. Okay, so let me uh, check in. So you're saying these verses started to come to you from the age of two. Sometimes it needed a little bit of polish, but for the most part, they were also you know, just almost like stream of consciousness. Mm-hmm. And uh, and you emphasize simplicity as a key part of it. So they evoke a certain meaning very simply and clearly, not just to ourselves, but even to children. Um, and that's something that, you know, mainstream, you know, perhaps humanities or media or whoever it is that are the authorities in the world of like the arbiters of like good, good style in writing you know, weren't necessarily embracing that at all. And uh, it, you know, gave you a psychological setback more than a professional setback, just in discouraging you, I guess, like from even seeing the potential in you to more actively enrich the world with with, with these things for what, for 30 years, you said? Yeah, I was so, so Doug and I faced a setback at Melissa and Doug, and we decided we were going to leave toys and go to graduate school and that he would be a university administrator, a president ultimately, and I would basically teach creative writing. You know, I wanted to be sort of a professor who who taught um, poetry. So we applied to school, and I submitted these verses and to to a not well known literary department by any stretch. And I got rejected, and my dramatically rejected. And the the head of the department said, "Your verses are sick, sophomoric was the word um, he used, and not." the caliber our program demands. And that word sophomoric, which I needed to look up because even being a writer, I didn't know the meaning. It was inane, stupid, foolish, dumb. I mean, it was like like soul um, piercing to the extent that, you know, cause those verses, as I, I saw them in my head, they came out exactly as they were. Like I, yeah. I couldn't change them. And, and philosophically it became this, huge chip on my shoulder that why do people need to make the beautifully simple things more complex? Why do they need to take something that is so pure in its explanation of something and actually layer on a whole bunch of shrouding to make it non-decipherable and like unable to be understood by regular people? And I was like livid at this, but I, I kept it, of course, quiet. And I just it was a it was a, a dagger in my in my soul. And just by the alchemy of my life, thank goodness, by accident, Doug and I decided to form a toy company. And that same philosophy, which again is that it's all about the beautiful, authentic simplicity and those simple truths, right? Speaking louder than the 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 masking we do for so much. How amazing that that was able, that philosophy was able to channel into something else other than words and, and create those toys. So I was, I was in a sense, like redeemed through um, my second creative sort of exploit, which was toys. Yeah. 
there are three things that you know your story points to that I want to highlight for our listeners and um, you know feel free to react to any of these as well but that I really deeply relate with in what you just shared the first is this um, you know value of simplicity uh, so I share with you a concern as well that we have overcomplicated the world in many ways and uh, seem to almost um, you know uh, feel like there's some kind of social order that is built on uh, the you know a, a, an assumption that um, the most uh, refined things in the world are only going to be accessible to some elite you know you know kind of highly qualified you know, um, you know small group of people and if you know yeah. something is actually accessible to everybody well then that means it's not special you know yeah. uh, as opposed to the complete opposite right like yes. that is really special yes. should be able to stir every human spirit you know yes. and, and, and all that right and isn't so, that the isn't that the purpose of art? You know, I, I, I go on a rail in my book Absolutely. and I say, yeah. isn't the purpose of art to stir the soul? When you make it something that needs to be deciphered, it leaves the heart and goes into the head. And that isn't powerful. That doesn't move us. That doesn't impel us to feel. So yes, I felt like the whole thing had gotten messed up. And the, the irony of my life is I never liked poetry anybody's poetry other than Emily Dickinson and Robert Frost, who were the most simple, clear poets, because I didn't understand it. And I didn't want to take time deciphering it because I just wanted to feel something. I just wanted to be moved in my soul. Mm. So, and I felt very much the same with toys because when we went into toys, right. everybody had forgotten about those beautiful classic playthings that had the ability simply to spark a child's imagination. So toys had become all toy and no child, right? They're all bells and whistles, they're dancing. Even back when we started, Cabbage Patch and Care Bears and they had dancing toys and they were battery. And basically the toy was like this and the child was like this. And it was all toy and the child's just sitting there like pushing the button and becoming bombarded with stimuli. We believe that a good toy, which is an open-ended plaything, is 90% child, 10% toy. Oh, and the, beautiful. And the toy is just a bridge to unleash that child's imagination. And once their imagination is unleashed, unleashed, you don't need the toy. You throw the toy away. You put the toy to the side. Like then anything is possible. Because when you're in your imagination, right? Anything you can dream is possible. Ah, oh, it uh, sends chills down my spine. It is so beautiful, your philosophy and you know the way you've just articulated. Um, I share the same concern about where the discipline of art has gone. And you know, when you in a well well curated exhibition have to read, you know, the very highbrow language, you know, that introduces this art piece in some very intellectually advanced way. I mean, it's just like, wait a second, but I just want to get stirred. I remember Gandhi had a quote like this. He said, like, the purpose of art is to inspire the human condition to uplift itself. Yes. And he says, like any art that doesn't do that to me is not art. You know, he's very clear about that. I mean, so I, I, I think that's such a beautiful like um, movement for us to try to help, uh, you know, advance in the world, which is, hey, you know, folks in the art world, you know, you have such a beautiful medium, you know, in your hands and you're so creative and talented and gifted, but can you please use it for the right ends to stir the human spirit, right? I, I also have, you know, in my studies found that, um, sim you know, when I look at like a bell curve, you know, people who are like all across like various levels of capabilities from the underperformers to the average performers to the outperformers, right? Like a bell curve, you look at the outliers, with the outliers, the Einsteins, the Picassos, the Gandhis, the Mother Teresa's, the Eleanor Roosevelt's, you find this, you know, Steve Jobs, right? You find this consistent theme that they're all obsessed with simplifying their craft. Exactly. You know? uh, so look at Elon Musk. Look at Elon Musk, yeah. Right? He, he, when he talked about, I think it's called First Principles, it, it's exactly like, I was like, oh my gosh, that's the way, I mean, I don't use those big words, but that's the exact way that I talk about it as well. Yeah, yeah. It, um, it's really taking these 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 pots that are simmering on the stove, right, and and distilling out all the the rough the rough surfaces and being left with just the gems that you can then connect to form these like incredible insights. The essence, right? The essence. You know, the what's essence, at the very core. <laughs> 
down to its essence so that all that exists is the beauty and the wisdom, right? That, that beautiful wisdom of it. And that's what, you know, my verses are basically taking these, these big ideas and distilling it to just the pithy little piece of wisdom that I can carry in my heart and become sort of my lifelines for how I want to live my life. Beautiful. Beautiful. Are you familiar with John Wooden? Yes, of course. The coach. Yes, yes. Coach yes. Wooden. Yeah. So for those of our listeners who aren't, uh, so Coach Wooden was the most successful college basketball coach in American history. He coached the UCLA basketball team, lived a long and beautiful life till about, I think, the age of 99 when he just a few years ago passed away. And um, yeah, he was like the most successful coach and a legend. And that's why you know him too, isn't it? And I don't know if you know this about him, um, but um, he loved these, these forms of verses, you know, this form of poetry. I don't think it was self-composed. I think in his case, he had um, borrowed some from here and borrowed some from there. But I've seen a couple of interviews with him and he would just uh, constantly break into poetry, you know, from some of these poems as to deliver a certain principle or an idea or an inspiration to his audience, just like you did, you know, when you invoked a couple of your own poems. So, uh, so you remind me a little bit of, of him in that regard. But of course, in this case, even more accomplished in the sense that these are your own compositions. You know, and I think I think the other thing that we forget and I and I, you know, I have young people in my life. I'm a mother of six, but I talk with so many young people is we've become so attached to this idea of success. Right. And what we're going to achieve that we've lost sight of the verb. We're living in the noun. And one of the verses that has become another one of my, my mantras, it's about living, living in the verb, which is it's the learning, not the grade. It's the crafting, not what's made. It's crusading, not the war. It's competing, not the score. It's the acting, not the part. It's the painting, not the art. It's the journey, not the goal for engaging fuels the soul. And, Beautiful. you know, I feel like those of us who, the ones you, you talk about, and those of us who truly revel in the verb, we are living in our hearts and engaging in what we love to do at the simplest level every single day. We don't get caught up in the like the the titles and what we wear and how we look. I mean, I don't even wear makeup like because it we we're trying to show it doesn't matter, you know, like Steve Jobs wearing the same clothes every day. Like he's trying to show it's not the trappings, it's the work. It's the 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 engaging the process the doing what we love every single day and and i think being accepted how we do it is is the key to to finding fulfillment yeah 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 i wonder what you think if i were to call it the channeling of spirit in the following sense that a moment ago i used the metaphor of your mind being like a computer you know, with a very remarkable, you know, hard drive that you keep putting the right data into and then the CPU that uh, is able to algorithmically just like figure out these beautiful poems. But is it possible also that uh, our minds are like browsers, you know, where we can through our mind connect to some kind of worldwide of universal web yes. of insight, inspiration, guidance, etc. that's out there and under the right conditions for the right people if they're tuning in then grace can flow. Oh, that is an amazing concept because having studied um, existential philosophy and I work with an existential philosopher, you know, there's this, this two principles, whether existence precedes essence or essence precedes existence. And most existentialists say that existence precedes essence. Like we're just born, we're nothing. And it's through the decisions we make that we become something. I believe what you said, that essence precedes existence. I believe that we are born with that thing in us. And maybe it is channeled from somewhere else because sometimes that's the only way you can you can think that that happened. Like sometimes I write a verse and there are words in it that I have to look up in the dictionary oh, wow. because I don't know them. Wow. And, and, and I've talked to my existential philosopher about it because she believes existence precedes essence. And I said, well, then how do you explain that? And she said, I can't. Um, yeah. And she's, yeah. you know, this, she studied this her whole life. So she said, in your case, it is, there is an essence. And, yeah. um, and I do believe in every one of us, whether you see things in your head or not, I believe 
we have that beautiful spark of self-expression in our souls. Sometimes we don't have a childhood or we don't have the chance to discover what it is, but our life goal is to find that beautiful seed of self-expression in our souls, figure out how to channel it so that it can come out through your hands and impact humanity. And it's only when we do that, that the circle becomes complete and we find that sense of purpose we've been seeking. Let's let's build on what you just said. So oftentimes what I find us doing is trying to mimic in some ways the outer behavior, the outer craft of some person we want to emulate, you know, yep. because they're really good at something or the yep. other. But, you know, here you are. And I think what you are pointing to is actually, you know what, approach it more from the inside out, not the outside in. Just um, the core principle here is to get to discover and know your essence and then seek to express that in a way which will be very unique to who you are. And not everybody's going to be a Melissa. Not everybody's going to have this tremendous uh, gift, you know, that you have of uh, expressing simple creative forums, you know, in toys and in words and in you know, poetry. Um, and yet each person will have their own special something. Is that is that fair? It's exactly the case. But the issue is that we are extrinsically motivated and and from the time we're little, right, we're not taught to make that inward journey. We're not taught to say what makes you unique. In fact, it's the opposite. We're taught when you feel like an outlier, which is how I felt my whole life, yeah. you're, 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 you're made fun of, right? You're rejected. I mean, yeah. I was told all the time, you're too, you're too weird, you're too heady, you're too dark, you're too emotional, like you're too everything. And I wanted nothing more than to look extrinsically and and I, well, that's what I did. I denied everything I was in my truth and just tried to emulate people who I would never be and was left in this middle spot, right? This is who I am. Up here is who I'm trying to be. I can never attain it. So it's a futile race and I'm, and I'm denying who I am. So you wonder why so many of us are in this, this state where we're just suffering and we're miserable because we kind of know who we are. It's, it's simmering down there but we're trying to be something that we can never be. So I think part of, you know, lifelines, part of what I'm trying to do now is to finally in accepting who I was. And it took me until middle age to be honest about who I was and accept what I call the blurs, the blessing right. and the curse of mm -hmm. being a highly sensitive, creative person. I'm now trying to show others if you can, and parents, if you can allow your children to be who they are, not who you want them to be, you will save them a lifetime of suffering. Blurs, what a powerful idea, fusing of opposites, um, which um, you know you open us up to. So thank you so much for that. Melissa, a while back, I talked about how there were three things, you know, from your story and pivoting from the um, you know, the inner angst and the work on the poetry to getting rejected on that, you know, early on stopping that work, but then rechanneling it into creativity of the same kind of principle of simplicity into play for children and, and toys. Uh, you know, I said there were three things I was taking away from it. One was what we've just talked about, the power of simplicity. Another was another thing we've talked about, you know, which was the um, idea of turning, you know, turning a, a curse into a blessing, you know, t turning something which is really hurting you from within, but just channeling it, you know, into something really beautiful in the outside, then finding redemptive possibilities in it, you know, you find meaning in it, you know, a Viktor Frankl kind of like approach, right? Mm -hmm. Which I know is, is an author that, you know, has influenced you and what an inspiring and beautiful soul uh, there, isn't it? And then, and and then the third thing that I really found powerful in that is really in some ways the core theme of this podcast, which is intersections. You know, this idea that everything connects with everything else, which is like a Leonardo da Vinci kind of idea, that everything connects with everything else. And we must dissolve boundaries and then we actually can explore things to their fullest potential. And, you know, you're showing us that. Like, you know, don't slot yourself into thinking that I'm a poet or I'm a writer. And that's the only thing. That's the only thing. And either I'm going to succeed or fail at that. Maybe there's a period of time in which that has to be rechanneled. And in your case, it was rechanneled into a very successful innovation for, for children. I'm seeing that right now with Zelensky, you know, a comedian. But actually, you know, most people find like that has nothing to do with what he's being asked to do as a wartime leader. But actually it does. Because comedy yes. is about tuning yourself to yes. the audience, understanding yes. the sensibilities, then trying to reframe a situation from like the humdrum of life into, in his case, levity for comedy, but now like a hero's journey and inspiration for the Ukrainians to kind of fight unto death if needed, you know, to save their country. So I'm seeing many of the same attributes just um, reinterpreted, you know, for a new form of expression on the outside. Yes. 
The chattel is just the byproduct of who you are and who your, you know, what your philosophy and your core tenets are. So for me, right, my core tenet is that it's all about simplicity. It's all about distilling things to their essence. And then what remains are the, is the truth, right? Those are the truths that you want to then yell out to the, to the, to the world. And I think that's the, the, the goal in life is to, is to go inward and discover that and then have the courage to express that to the world. So yes, I think once you find that, and it takes a lot of courage to listen to the cry of your soul, it's intuition that needs to grow. Once you have that, it'll be reflected in everything you do. So as you said, his philosophy, you know, Zelensky is like that life should have humor to it right? And you should be able to find the light in the dark. And, and that if that's his philosophy, he's going to channel it in everything he does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you, um, you know, and I want to come back to lifelines, because that's such an important, you know, and, and uh, for the world, I think a very valuable chapter that you have started to unfold in your career. Uh, and just before we get there, on, on the toys business, since we do have an audience that uh, has many you know, aspirants in it from an entrepreneurship standpoint, you know, I do teach in a business school. So uh, what I love about your story is how you were able to preserve the integrity of, of, of these, these core principles and ideas, put something out there that is of beautiful service to the world, you know, taking children to exactly where they should be 90% the child and 10% the toy, uh, and yet make it also a commercial success. You know, it's a dream for most entrepreneurs. So um, along the way, you must have faced certain skeptics, certain barriers, certain dead ends where people were rolling their eyes and saying, no, this toy is not rich enough. It's not stimulating enough or you yep. know, something. And so how did you and Doug like override those moments? Ah, oh, that's an amazing question. And and by the way, I um, we have an entrepreneurs program at Duke University and and we mentor um, hundreds of entrepreneurs every year. So, oh, so it, that's is this your alma mater? Is that right? Yeah. Member? Exactly. Mm -hmm. This is an amazing question. So the only way you turn off the clamor of the outside world is to always go back to your heart and your soul and the reason you're doing it. And I think the only reason Doug and I are still growing, Melissa and Doug, after 30, we're in our 34th year, is because we never lost sight of the reason we were doing it. And every time I create a toy, I go back to that place of, of expansiveness. I go back into my imagination. And my only goal is to unleash a sense of joy in children through catalyzing their imagination. And that's the only reason we're doing it. So if you have those core principles front and center, we never did it for money. We, I mean, we wouldn't have started a toy company in 1988 if we wanted to do it for money. That was like the investment banking uh, uh, boom. But um, we, we never did it for money. We never did it for like the, the licensing opportunities or any of that shiny, shiny stuff. We did it because we wanted to impact children's lives and allow them to see the extraordinary in the ordinary through unleashing their imaginations. So every time we were presented with like a shiny gold thing, like we can partner with this, we can get into this category. We can, it was like, you're on your, your path, right? You, you know, what made you successful. And then everybody's like, like wiggling, dangling these, these lures in front of you, like, come over here, come over here, get off your path. And you're like enticed, you stop for a minute, you're like, should we go over there? Should we go over there? But then you have to breathe. It's literally like an exercise in mindfulness. And you have to say, why am I doing this? And you have to remember your core tenets, which you should write right in front of you. And then you say, nope, that isn't, is that unleashing imagination in a child? Is that um, giving a child the gift of open-ended play? Is that sparking something in that child that will lead to their life passion or purpose? Nope. We're not going to go there. And, you know, we became really good at saying no, because we said no a lot more often than we said yes. And we started to disappoint a lot of people, you know, by saying like, no, we're not going to go there. We're going to go this way. And we got a lot of questioning. We got a lot of people like whispering, like they're not doing what they should do. But you know what? It led to uh, a purity that we really needed. 
And um, I can share another really cool story too, if you want. Oh, please do. So, you know, I am a white space pre product innovator, meaning I don't really use a lot of outside data at all. I don't, I don't subscribe to the traditional MPD data, the market insights. I don't look at trends. I don't do anything. I don't look at fads. I, I literally do it from my own experience, having six children, going out in the market. It's not like I don't, I don't, I love to get, get absorbed like stimuli, but then I let those pots simmer, right? And, it, and, and some of those, sometimes I combine one pot and another and until they boil over, like I, I don't, I don't do it. So I, we had a, a an analyst come in, a, a McKinsey, Harvard analyst, and he decided to calculate how successful I was in, in my product innovations. And he studied the prior three years and he calculated that I was only 40% successful, meaning more than half the time, 60% of the time, my new products failed. And he decided that his goal was to make me more successful because if we could get that 40% up to 80%, Melissa and Doug would be a lot more successful. And the only way he thought we could do it was by fewer, bigger bets and more consumer insight. And that that would sort of sort of uh, change it. And, and this was one of the most horrifying experiences of my life because, you know, as a white space create, creator, I believe in planting as many seeds as humanly possible. And I believe you can never know success ahead of time. You can get all the consumer insights you want. You can study data. You can look at what's been done. But if you're innovating, if you're creating something that's never been done, how the heck are you going to be able to know if it's going to be successful? You're not until it's in the marketplace. So my philosophy has always been like plant as many seeds as, you, as possible, give them fertilizer, water them, give them sunlight, and then watch, like, and be patient and see which grow. And the ones that grow, you, you give more water, more fertilizer, the ones that don't, you go, darn, like, I don't get it. What, why, are, why are you just a pile of dirt still? But that's the essence of product innovation. So I think it was a really tough time because it really pitted me against the mainstream in our company. Like, you know, are you going to allow just plain innovation to, to rule it, knowing that your failure rate is going to be greater, but you're going to have a higher likelihood, in my opinion, of the successes sort of allowing yourself to be open to trying just about anything and not being terrified of the failure. So I love the fact, and I tell people all the time that I fail more than I succeed, but that still led to a 600 plus million dollar company right now that's growing every year. Ah, there's just so much of genius, you know, in the story you've shared and the principles you've espoused. I'm so happy that you're doing this program at Duke. I wish even more people on the entrepreneurial path can uh, can hear you uh, share the story. I relate to it very much. Um, you know, in my case, Minecraft is, uh, you know, developing a model for life and for leadership and, uh, you know, integrating into that, you know, the deeper spiritual principles that I've uh, had a deep appreciation and respect for in the world and all of that. And oftentimes in that process, in that journey, I've had people come to me, hey, Tenra, you should read that book or you should, you know, watch, read that report. And I'm like, you know, smiling, but then in my mind saying, no, I'm not going to do that. Yes. I'm not going to do that because... It'll infiltrate the purity or whatever it is I'm trying to yes. create from within. And yes, there's an integration, like you said, of various conversations I've had with people or things I've read in the news or, you know, the uh, experiences I've had in the classroom. But finally, you have to just get into that inner space, isn't it? And from there, something has to emerge, which is really integral to who you are. So I could experience a little bit of that, you know, in, in the way that you have um, described, you know, your very successful creative endeavor. And yes, like you're saying, it still is a bunch of experiments that leads to some amount of reality checks from the outside and then you use that to refine it. How beautiful. Well, what, what, a, what an amazing model to offer to all of us. Thank you, Melissa. And it's so great to see it validated with all the success that you've seen as well in, in the world. There's, if I hear you correctly, there's a certain ethos almost of like non-attachment to outcome that, that I see there where kind of like success comes to those who are actually not chasing success. Because we love the act of what we're doing. Like for me, it's, it's my salvation is the channeling, right? And the creating that toy and the belief that that toy might have the ability to change the trajectory of a child's life. 
So every toy I create or every product I create or every verse I create, I'm going back to that, that same place. It's the exact same feeling I'm conceiving for the very first time. It's not oh, like no, I've made, no. I don't ever think about the ones I've made before it. I don't think about what's happening tomorrow. I am so in the flow of just connecting to that sense of purpose and channeling um, that. And, and, you know, I've, I've read about Bruce, Bruce Springsteen and anyone who, you know, who really loves what they do, they're doing it because that sense of flow is so profound that they don't want to ever give it up. So I think it's, it's, you know, that someone is, is for real when like they're going back to that simplest, that simplest place, right? The, the place where it all just starts to, to gel and flow. That's where the, the beauty is. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Melissa. I, I want to transition us into lifelines, uh, if that's okay with you. Sure. Um, you know, you have shared that, uh, you know, that early life angst, that, uh, you know, that questing, you know, spirit that you've had, that you've been like really striving to look for meaning, you know, the existential kind of pursuits that you've been taking on. And now after this very successful toy business that is still thriving, here you are taking on a new chapter. Mm -hmm. What uh, motivates you to do this work? And um, what can our listeners access from lifelines that might help support them in their own journey to Perhaps, yeah, getting to discover that core, that essence of who they are and channeling it in very positive and service-oriented ways in the world because it's such a beautiful service that you're providing to learn from your own life, codify the principles and ideas and, and offer it up to us. That's an amazing question. Yeah, you know, I found tremendous salvation in making toys for three decades. It literally made me realize that I could take something so dark and turn it into something light. And that was profound. But... I was still hiding the essence of who I was because I was only this light, bright. I was almost like the toys I was creating, right? I, myself, I was in a light, bright box and giving this sense of, of complete joy. And I've got it all together, together to the world. When the truth was, I was a full spectrum, right? I was that light, bright self. That's part of me. But I was also this dark, searching, churning, um, existentially angsty person. And the cry of my soul to be completely authentic started to grow louder and louder the older I got. And I realized that I didn't want to die being inauthentic and not showing the truth of who I was. So I decided it always starts with our, as you said, with ourselves and the story. I felt like I had to come out and I had to just show folks that I create from the full spectrum of emotion. And a lot of it is really dark, but it doesn't mean I can't transform it into light. And that became one of the messages. So I came out, I went on one of my favorite podcasts and shared the truth that I had this existential angst, which by the way, is not diagnosed. It's not in the DSM. It's not pathological. It's a, it's a philosophical, spiritual condition. And I wanted to share that because nobody understood what I was really going through. And I found that people got it. I received hundreds and hundreds of the most powerful, profound letters ever with people saying, like, you gave voice to what I've been experiencing my whole life and no one ever understood. So when that happened, when I received validation for the first time ever for, for coming out and saying who I was, it gave me three sort of uh, reasons to want to do something outside of Melissa and Doug. And the first was I wanted to show others that they weren't alone. Because I think when people feel different, and I felt so different and, and so unlike the world and that I would never fit in, we feel like this sense of aloneness, it's like soul aloneness. It's a deep, a deep aloneness. And even though I had beautiful people all around me, I, I didn't believe they'd accept except me as I was. So I hid it. I hid that sense of being different um, from everyone. And I wanted so many folks that have hid that same despair to know that they're not alone. Two, I wanted to show others that they can take something so dark. I mean, I experienced existential nihilism. There's no deeper form of despair. And I wanted to show them that even if you're there, you can channel that darkness into light and make meaning. And that is the definition of what I've done. And I feel so grateful to have 
to still be here, to still be alive, creating that I want to show others they can do the same. And then the third, which is really important too, is I was racing externally my whole life to fill an inner void. And so many of us, again, Western culture says like, race out there in the pursuit of happiness, pursue it. It's out there. You'll, you'll get there. And we never do. So it isn't until we finally make the choice because it's a choice to stop racing out there for the shiny gold stars and the, the material awards. And we make that journey inward to finally discover and accept who we are and allow it all to be part of our experience that we will finally find the peace and fulfillment we've been seeking and really creating tools to allow folks to do that and to create a deliberate practice in their lives so they can unlock their full potential is what Lifelines is doing. Yeah. I, I really love that you ended with that last part about, uh, you know, tools, you know, to give people like practical steps they can take. Because uh, I was thinking of what you're saying in the context of my own life. And I know for me, like over the years, um, you know, I ignored it for a long time. But finally, I made a grudging investment in something that I had always intuitively known was going to be really important for me, which was to cultivate a daily practice of meditation. And I finally did it. And when I got there about 20 years ago, I mean, it's been like the greatest friend, you know, on earth for me. And uh, so I'm curious, you have, you know, over the course of our conversation shared, you know, so many of these uh, powerful, you know, moments where you've been able to kind of like go within, get to your core, and then just re-express it in just the right way, you know, channel, you know, the darkness into light. And, you know, it's a very compelling philosophy and at the same time, you must have certain practices that you use to help you get there, right? And you also mentioned that some of these are now tools on the Lifelines, uh, yeah. you know, website, right? Uh, yeah. Could you could you just share like one or two examples of practices that have really helped you uh, in those moments? Yes, yes, and and everyone should know that although maybe I I look like everything's good, I if I didn't have my practice each and every day. I would either fly off into the boundless expanse of life of white space and get lost up there because when I'm creating, I don't want to come down or I could very easily fall into the abyss of existential darkness and never come back. So mm. literally I engage in my practice every single day. So the first are tools for my vitality, like my, my self care, because I tend to not be a good sleeper. I don't want to sleep because I have ideas flowing 24 mm seven. -hmm. I don't want to eat because I don't want to take the time. So I have to like, basically, you could call it like filling my well. So I have a life force to do anything. So I have to make sure I eat well that I sleep at least seven hours a night, which is almost impossible for me to mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. do. And and engage in movement, I have to not exercise because right. exercise is punishing. I have to actually take a walk in nature every single day because oh, nature beautiful. does something to my senses that nothing else does. And I feel I transcend my, my rigid self and I enter the cosmos and I'm connected mm -hmm. to something so much greater. So that's really important. And then grounding is so important because I tend to become triggered and destabilized very easily because I'm, I'm hypersensitive. So grounding is my own journey and I call it the journey to inner space. It's on our website. It's free. And it's a five letter acronym that I use whenever I'm becoming untethered. So I stop and sense what I'm like. I stop and I'm like, what's going on here? Like what, what's happening? I perceive what I'm feeling and I picture what I'm feeling. That's the right. P in space. I accept what I'm feeling because a lot of times I, we judge what we're feeling and that's not, that's not conducive to, to grounding. Mm -hmm. And I allow all of it to flow. If I'm feeling jealous, if I'm feeling angry, if I'm feeling sad, I finally allow it as opposed to repressing it. Mm -hmm. Then I comprehend, I go back to that sort of inner wound and I say like, why are you becoming untethered? Why is this getting you so angry? And I realize it's usually not the situation or the person. It's something in my childhood that is still needs attention. So I comprehend why it's happening. And then I correct the behavior. As you talked about, we have a lot of flawed mind thinking. We have a lot of cognitive distortions. I correct those. And then at the end, I embrace myself for being human. 
Mm -hmm. And I engage in the flow of life, which means I do something that puts me in the flow of really like acting, living, creating, enjoying. And I do that about 10 times every single day, that journey. Anytime I start to get off my game or I'm becoming untethered by someone, I take my quick space journey and I come back home to myself. That is uh, so nice to hear very, very practical prescriptions from you about sleep, about diet about walks in nature and ultimately the space uh, model for how to get yourself in the right mental space you know how beautiful you said because you're only human that might be the biggest understatement of our conversation you're superhuman Melissa. you're uh, anything but that. just merely human but i think what you're also doing is pointing out the capacity in each of us to be superhuman depending on how you define human and how you define superhuman, right? But uh, there are all these potentialities that are hidden from you at times. I don't know if you know this, but um, I discovered something really quaint once that um, astronomers basically have uh, established this, you know, sign of a fact that if you take the sun, right, the source of all our energy, that at the very center of the sun is what they call the sun's core. And that little center part of the sun is 1% of the sun's volume, you know, as a sphere, it's 1% of the sun's volume, but it's actually responsible for generating 99% of the energy that the sun gives to us. So, 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 you know, 99% of the reason you're alive and I'm alive and the earth is thriving is because of the energy we get from the sun is actually coming from the 1% of the very, very center. Wow. What if like, most of us haven't even gone there? Isn't that cool? Yes. Yeah. I love that. It's basically, you need to harness that potential. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I want to maybe turn, you know, so so you convinced me that you got tools here and that like, you know, you weren't really able to make this journey just by waving a magic wand. It was like through deliberate practice, you know, some kind of like daily disciplines that you put together. You've given us some examples of that. So thank you. There's more of that on the Lifelines website that you have so graciously offered to the world at large. And so our listeners and everyone who's interested, I'm certainly going to be very drawn to going and having a look myself can go there. Right. Um, but to in the confines of the time we have to take the conversation in one other direction. Um, one thing I wonder is that I see a, a tension, right, in your story between uh, two opposing forces. One is one that uh, attunes, you know, yourself to children in a way that, you know, so many of us perhaps have not done to understand their innate uh, gifts and nature and their right to thrive and flourish and play freely from within uh, and therefore not be encumbered by too much complexity in toys and yes. stimuli and all of that, right? So then on the one hand, there's that. And on the other hand, here you are, a woman of such incredible clarity of principles, of such deep felt values, someone who seeks to just like express them in every moment and who has also desired to want to manifest them to help support others in their journey, right? So now when you show up as a mother, you've got like both of these forces in you. Mm -hmm. uh, one to unleash freely the innate gifts and talents, but on the other hand, you've also got like, my dear kid, like, let me tell you, <laughs> you know, let me tell you, because I can know, you know, anyway. So how have you managed to balance these forces to, um, you know, to approach parenting in, in the way that you oh, think wow. has, has worked best? I'd say parenting has been my most challenging journey, to be honest with you. And I never give parenting advice because I joke that I had to have six children to rectify the mistakes I made with the earlier ones. I mean, it is so difficult. And I believe that we think we're doing what is in the best interest of our kids, but it isn't until you have them that you realize how many of your unfulfilled dreams you're trying to live through your children. And believe me, I believed I was selfless in every case, and I wasn't. I had expectations for them to fulfill things that I hadn't fulfilled myself. So I think, you know, it's really challenging. And I, um, before I accepted my full spectrum of who I was, which, by the way, is only in the last couple of years, I was a very flawed parent. You know, I didn't allow my kids to feel sad because I didn't allow myself to feel sad, because if I felt sad, I might not be here anymore. Like my sadness threatened to truly end my life. And I, I was terrified that would happen to them. So I never really allowed them to express sadness. And my other flaw as a parent, because you kind of said it, is I've been through such uh, a profound journey. And I do believe I have so much insight and kind of wisdom that like, I want to give them the shortcut. I want to be like, Psst, 
you don't have to suffer. Like this is the this is the answer. Like here it is, right here in a in a shining circle. And most of my therapy in the last couple years has been about that. How can I accept people as they are right. and not try to change them into where I want them to go? And it's not even so much their dreams or their goals. It's save them from wallowing. Wallowing really frustrates me. It's one of because I'm an existentialist, right? I believe that we as humans have to make the choice to take responsibility for our lives and make meaning. So when people don't, I want to like drag them there. I want to say, don't you see this is your one life? Like you have a limited time here, like make meaning. And that includes my children. So I have a hard time just allowing people their own experience. And I want to cheat them out of their experience and live life for them. Yeah, thank you for being so open about the um, eternal uh, struggle of being a conscientious parent. Uh, I think any or all of us who have that deep caring and desire to want to arrive just in the right way and have you know, us be able to ensure just the right future for our children mm -hmm. relates so much, right, to the... To the, to the way you've just described it. And uh, yeah, I mean, um, you know, if the story might be of any reassurance in the years ahead, let me just offer it up. When my father's 80th birthday, you know, came up, my mother asked me, she said, son, you're here with us today. I'm grateful. And uh, we're inviting friends and family this evening. I wonder if you could give like a talk of some kind just to memorialize, you know, this beautiful moment for your father and you've known him all your life. And, and I said, sure, you know, it sounds like a, easy and a, you know important thing to do and I'd love to do it and then I started to struggle over the next few hours because I was like but like all the memories I have of my really formative years and my interaction with my father was like he would say go left and I would go right you know he would say work in the United Nations and I was like no I'm gonna go into mathematics and business he would say you know just be here in this small town why do you need to like you know spread your wings and I was like no I'm gonna go to New Delhi I'm gonna go to America and all anyway he was say left now and, and so like how can I actually claim that he's had a very meaningful impact in my life where at every stage, I've actually, you know, really, you know, asserted, in a sense, my own thinking, you know, over his, I love him, I love him, and he's a beautiful person, but, and then I remember a little later in the morning, I was actually meditating, and then a whole stream of insights came to me, and they came around this core whisper, which is, Hetendra, do not focus on what he was telling you, focus on what he was doing in his own life and how that influenced you. And then I remembered, oh my heavens, like, because by now I was in my early 30s when this, con you know, when this thing happened, that he had been a very kind man, been a very helpful man to people, been very stoic in certain very, you know, moments of great struggle in the family, etc. And, uh, you know, he had a certain simplicity and purity to the way he lived his life, just saving for a rainy day and all of that. And I remember how those flashes of recollection would come up in me years after I had left my home. In a certain moment, hey, Tindra, you know, you talked about McKinsey. I worked at McKinsey for a while. So he's like, no, you know, you're working here, but are you truly, truly helping the world? Are you truly, truly, you know, and, and those projects where I do did feel the client's products were actually doing that, I would feel better. But those projects where I didn't feel that, you know, I was feeling worse and all of that. And so similarly with some of the other aspects of his nature that I could more or less into it more because it had my subconscious. They hadn't gone into my conscious mind until that moment. And then when the moment came and I gave my talk, I really recollected more just like those ways in which he had subconsciously been influencing us, but just by living his truths, not by preaching his truths. And I, I shared like, that's my big lesson that, you know, the way we influence the next generation is by living our truths. Anyway, so, I, you know, I'm sure in the years ahead, you're going to see all six of your beautiful kids really start to um, more deeply show evidence of influence, you know, that you had more simply just by being who you are. Yeah, you know, I think uh, the model I want to show is that you can transform your darkness into light and make meaning. And that's the only thing I want to show, that we're all going to have ups and downs, but if we can take those downs and somehow harness them to, to be our superpower, then we have done the ultimate. Ah, uh, yeah, so beautiful. As a final thought, can you share, like, at a time when, you know, humanity seems so challenged with all that's going on, I don't think it's lost on any of us. Uh, whether it's the mental health crisis, the uh, ecological and environmental imbalance, the geopolitical tension, social, you know, rifts in the country and mm -hmm. and beyond. What is like, what is, you know, um, perhaps like one of the, you know, the poems that you've written that might come to your mind or a certain thought and idea that might come to your mind that could be a guidepost, you know, for all of us to help um, 
you know, help us like support humanity in whichever community we are part of, whichever family, you know, that we are invested in or profession we are in, just something that could guide us to um, take this moment and rather than just wallow, right, as you said, to actually show up in the right way to do the right thing. Yeah, I mean, there's a story that changed my life. And I think sometimes when we think too grand, right? When we see all these huge problems and we feel like we're just one little person, we get in our head, we become completely overwhelmed. Like I can't do anything, so I won't do anything. I'll hide out in my little corner and not do anything. But one simple story um, about a year ago changed my life and, and made me feel completely powerful. So there is a man, I don't know if you've heard of him, Kevin Hines, I believe that's his name. He basically suffered from a lot of mental health challenges, his, his whole life. And he determined that he wanted to end his life. His life was so, so much suffering, so much meaninglessness that he wanted to end it. However, he would go through the day and he was going to jump off the Golden Gate Bridge. He would go through the day. And if one person mm -hmm. showed him that they cared about him, if one person smiled at him, said hello, he wouldn't take his life. So he was going to like basically base it on others and how they treated him. And he went through the day and it was just a horrible day. Basically, people ignored him. They yelled at him. They demeaned him. And at the end of the day, he he jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge and he ended up being saved by, I believe it was a sea lion who like basically kept him afloat until he was rescued. And now he's become a suicide prevention advocate. Anyway, that story wow. changed my life. Because I realized the power of one person to start the ball rolling, to be that one ripple that could turn into a tsunami of healing. So now one thing that I do, you know, and I, I try to do other things too, but one simple thing is wherever I am, wherever I go, and I walk every day, I drive places. Whenever I see a person, I look them in the eye and I say, hello, hello nice day. How are you? Because that person might be Kevin Hines. That mm. person might be thinking of doing something very dire to themselves, to others. And maybe I alone can change the trajectory of that person's life. And it's so easy. I'm going through the day anyway, right? I'm passing these people anywhere from in the car and I'm next to someone. I'll just wave and say hi. And they'll look at me like a lot of them were like really grumpy and they'll look at me and they'll kind of be like, why is she looking at me? And then they'll just go, and I, and I watch them drive off and they have a smile on their face. So, you know, I'm a big believer in you must heal yourself first. You must do be the light you want to see. You must be a shining example of engaging in the act, not the goal. And just do your thing. Shine your light. Be kind to every single person and show them they're seen. And if we can, if each one of us can do that, and show every person we come across, even if it's five in a day, that we see them. I mean, they're going to go through their days differently. And suddenly it's going to become millions of people. So beautiful. So beautiful. What a powerful, again, you know, just a visualization for you to give us. Just like you started this conversation with a visualization. And this one is around, you know, just recognizing that any person that you encounter could be that Kevin Hines. And therefore, why not give them that little bit of love or joy or smile that, uh, you know, would um, transform their life for that day. Um, and I was going to notice that you have this such an endearing warmth to you and a smile, you know, to you that you really showered us with all through this conversation. And uh, now you've explained that through the lens Aww. of this, you know, the story. And it, it reminds me of a verse. You know, when we heal ourselves, we heal the world as consciousness transcends single soul to all humanity and everyone ascends. Ah, yeah, yeah. So beautiful. So beautiful. Melissa, one other thing I noticed as we bring this conversation to a closure then is that you've uh, from time to time been like folding your hands and perhaps you're aware of this or perhaps not, but this is um, a very beloved um, form of expression in uh, the uh, Indian, you know, kind of uh, culture, uh, you know, namaste, you know, and um, Einstein once asked, um, you know, Mahatma Gandhi, he wrote a letter to him and said, like, I've noticed in some of the newsreels that uh, you're folding your hands like this. Um, what does that gesture mean? And, um, you know, perhaps, you know, you do it from uh, another impulse. But um, as I, you know, seek to offer you my final little uh, expression of gratitude, I want to just read to you what uh, what 
you know, what Gandhi wrote back to Einstein to explain, you know, explain this namaste to him, because this is how I feel about the present moment here with you. Uh, and, and, and this is, you know, Gandhi's words. He said, I honor the place in you where the entire universe resides, a place of light, of love, of truth, of peace, of wisdom. I honor the place in you where when you are in that place and I am in that place, there is only one of us. Mm, wow. So thank you so much for that is so beautiful. Much that brought tears to my eyes. Uh -huh. That that is definitely why I'm 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 doing it. So thank you. You you got it. Yeah, that's so beautiful. You're you're giving me a high that is going to stay with me for a long time. Certainly, you know, well beyond the confines of today. So so Thanks. grateful. All the best to you and all that you're doing, and uh, you know, love to your family as well. And we look forward to having you. Take your work in lifelines and beyond from strength to strength. Thank oh, you. Thanking, thank you for allowing me to share my story and, and for all you're doing to truly change the world.